Rose Nose is here to show you how to not plant garlic. My hands are black with dirt from scratching goats and dogs. That sounds fun. It smells like a mix between hay and dog. Yum. Better late than never. Yeah. One of the benefits of living in Georgia is our growing season allows us to get a late planting of our garlic crop. Whoops. Few too many right there. Oh, and I can't bend over. Don't I can't worry bend over. So I, so I make Ryan do the bending and the hoeing. I'm just gonna come across and drop them and then the boys can bury them. And Ryan can bury two. Whoops. <laughs> Might end up with a few close together. Ugh. Oh, we never did weigh how many we were planting, did we? It's a lot. <laughs> this is a two-quart container. And we have a whole box down there, too. These aren't as big as the first round, but they're still growing just fine. What I found is that I can pick out the biggest, fattest cloves and plant just those or I can plant anything that looks viable and I usually get about the same results so I know I know most people say pick out your fattest healthiest ones and logically that makes sense scientifically that makes sense but even the little ones are producing so you're still gonna get a head of garlic maybe it won't be your biggest head but it'll still be an opportunity for that clove to become bigger because really, maybe it wasn't big because it was younger. Maybe it was the small one of that head. And it was actually from a big head. You don't know. No need to judge. We really do have too much garlic. Lay it on thick. I mean, really, this is just going to basically be a garlic field. We're just going to prolong the life of each individual. They're Huzzah! Not, they're not even going to form heads. <laughs> we're just going to keep each garlic clove alive. So, basically what we're going to have to keep in track of, because we're doing it so thick, is it's going to need a lot of food throughout the season. It's going to need heavy feeding of nitrogen and such. So, our quail poop, if we make a pile of it that we can compost so it's not hot anymore, or make a manure tea with it. Put it in a bucket of water and let it ferment for a little bit. And that water, use that to water the garlic with. That'd be a good video. Okay, so typically we plant our garlic in like October, November. We're in the beginning of January, middle of January. And we still have not got it in the ground. But the rule with garlic is as long as the ground isn't frozen you can still plant and we don't ever get a frozen ground so we're just gonna have a later harvest probably than usual but with the hot weather we're having this winter already this might be a good thing that we waited we definitely overseeded we definitely did it wrong we are not trying to show you how to do it right in this video we're showing you how to just get it done sometimes that is all you can do and when you're six months pregnant and you have two little kids and you can't bend over like you used to and you have homeschooling and all the other stuff that goes along with life in general sometimes you don't get the time to come out here and do it the right way so we're gonna try to show you guys that sometimes if you do it the wrong way it still works <laughs> because i promise you we will still have some garlic to harvest come summertime so we are we were gonna do rows 
three even rows and properly spaced garlic. But once I realized I had way too much garlic, we've got all of this just kind of strewn. I just ended up just sprinkling it all across the top and I still have that many that didn't get planted, including another basket on top of the shelf on my front porch that we've been using from eating and they're starting to grow. So we could plant a whole bunch more garlic, but what we have time to do today is one bed. So one bed, we're gonna quickly bury it with a hoe. Some are gonna get buried upside down. Some are gonna be sideways. Some are gonna be too shallow. Some are gonna be too deep. It's okay. At this point in time, we have enough seed garlic to use because we kept all of our garlic that we harvested in July or June, whenever that was that we harvested. So it's, it's working with what you have, doing the best that you can in the condition that you're in to do it. I have a task where it doesn't matter if I do it the right way or not. <laughs> Just get it done. Yeah, it's kind of the point we're at. Sometimes the wrong way is better than no way. It's so true. It's better to have it planted wrong than planted perfect and not have as much or not have the time to do it. So some of you might be wondering why we have so much green here in our winter beds and why we're allowing it to stay. We do have a very good reason for that. These are what we call our weed friends. These weeds are good and friendly for multiple reasons. The, let's see, chickweed with the little white flower here is a wonderful edible salad addition and the flower does provide some nectar source and then we also have these purple blooms from purple dead nettle and henbit there's a mix um, throughout the beds so it's hard to point out they're very similar in color and shape so we just kind of lump them together they do provide food source for us if we choose to we can add it to a smoothie or a salad or we can leave them because they're providing a lot of nectar for our honeybees which have been out here visiting the whole time we've been out here on this beautiful sunny January day. The ducks and the chickens and the tractors have been moving closer and closer and closer so that we can pull them across here and into this area. This is the area of the garden that we have not built into mounds. You can see these are mounded beds. All of this. This has not been mounded yet. So the chicken tractors will sit on here just fine. And I really almost hate to bring them in here because there's so much nectar source for the honeybees that I'd really love to leave it for them. But that chickweed and henbit and dead nettle is going to provide such a great nutrition for the chickens. And it'll get them to scratch this up and get it ready for planting. We took the fence down around the garden when we were working in here a lot. And once we get all of the stuff started to be planted again, we're going to need to pull that fence back up again and run it back around this garden so that we won't have any deer issues. So we're going to have quite a few projects that need to be done before April 15th-ish. That is our normal first planting date. When I say normal first planting date, I mean for everything that's going to get direct sown or for transplanting our starts outside, like our tomatoes and peppers that we start in the grow room. They'll go out here after April 15th, after the danger of frost. We'll also be sowing by direct sown the seeds into the soil 
squash and cucumbers and melons and all of that summer vegetables that can't handle a frost and don't transplant well. They do much better if you just plant them right in the ground. Ooh, I'm not supposed to have this special treat in my garden because the asparagus that I grew is supposed to be sterile and not produce seed, but apparently I have a plant or two, because I've seen it in other spots, I didn't see it this year, I was looking for it this year because I was actually thinking, I'm going to try, why not, I've got time, time to plant asparagus seeds. Asparagus from seed takes forever and ever and ever. I mean, asparagus from crowns took us three years to get a nice crop from. But the way I see it is asparagus is one of those gifts that just keeps on giving. So no matter when I plant it, I'm gonna eventually, one day, have asparagus. So if I get a few seeds from each one of these, then that's a few more asparagus that I can plant in other locations. We love asparagus. Huh? You want to know what I'm doing? Yeah. Um, well, this is flopped over and touching the ground anyway. So, there's a tiny little root trying to form anyway. It's one of the best ways of getting more raspberry or blackberry. I'm not sure which one this is. It's the thornless, so I think it's the thornless blackberry, but I want to say I had thornless raspberry too. So I just dig a little hole and I'm going to bury that section of stem in between those two nodes and burying the node part with just the leaf sticking out and that'll form a whole new plant. I've been doing it with the one over there. Hush! It's the loudest honeybee I've ever heard. Wait, that's not a honeybee, that's a plane. Look, there's a strawberry bloom! Oh, Our dwarf mulberries. I was gonna prune them down in the fall, but I didn't get to it. I just noticed that these tips are dead on these smaller branches. You can tell by the way they crack when you break them. But another good way to tell if your fruit tree is still alive or dead, if you're afraid to break a tip off and have it be alive, is to take your thumbnail and just scratch a little spot. If you look real close, you'll see green. So you don't want to scratch a big piece off and make a big injury, but you can definitely see that the true stem is perfectly alive. So this plant will be just fine come spring. I'm checking our kiwi vine to see if any of that's showing sign of life. It looks like some of it is. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, look at this chickweed. This is what I would come and harvest for a salad. Just grab a big handful and cut it that is delicious, nice, fresh chickweed salad. These are our walking onions. Our friend sent us these and uh, they're doing really good. Survived the winter just fine. Our water level, if you guys know, uh, we had a pretty severe drought all summer. Well, this late fall and winter, we've had quite a bit of rain and it, has made a big difference around here. You can tell directly by looking at our pond and you can see the water level on the trees that surround the pond uh, behind me. I'll zoom in on them in a second. But you can see where the, the high part where the water has gone up, uh, it's almost to that point. And I've been back there hunting and stuff. I can see uh, areas that I was walking clear across no problems early hunting season now I can't cross because there's too much water so the water levels are being restored which is a good thing I was just wondering the same thing Liam where'd hey, your brother go 
I, I noticed a problem in our garden. What's that? Um, we have a few leaks. <laughs> Chad humor. Okay, I just realized that it was mysteriously quiet and I wondered where are the boys? What are they up to? So I came to find out. I see them sitting down up there having a conversation about something. I don't know what they're talking about. But they seem really involved with their conversation with each other. Just being brothers hanging out in the paddock with the goats. I'm so surprised the goats are not all over them. Looks like Liam found some ants. He's showing his brother. <laughs> Sweet, strong, independent boys. Exactly what I hoped for when I started a farm for them. These goats are so lazy. They are loving this beautiful weather. The especially large, plump, pregnant ones are just laying around. <laughs> Uh-oh, I've been spotted. What are you boys doing? We're watching the, um, the Oh. And the, and the ruins look like they were mating. They were? Oh, that's so cool. Another one actually came. Oh, okay. We usually do have three of them. So the boys were watching the buzzards mating. Fun times. You guys are true farm kids, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> are you liking your water? You drank it all. Oh my goodness. You know those are a special treat. You're supposed to savor them. Make sure, make sure you put it in the recycling when you're done. Love it when my man brings me some manure. So this is mostly already composted quail manure. There might be a thin layer of the fresh stuff on top. That's why we want to get it down on the ground now so that it can wash into the earth and let that nitrogen dissipate into the earth so that it won't be too hot when we go to plant this section. The deep litter method works for pretty much any animal manure um, for getting it well composted. Plus, we have soldier fly larvae that come in and help compost and break that down even further. And the ducks turn it for us with their beaks looking for the soldier fly. So it ends up creating a pretty close to perfect compost. But we always, always use caution with heat and compost and also bacteria. There's a possibility you could be harboring bacteria in your manure when you put it to your garden, so it's best to age it first. For those of you that haven't noticed how often I have a loud, old prop engine type plane interrupt my filming, we have a small airport really close by, <laughs> and there's a lot of historical planes that'll fly in and out of there um, for air shows and such. So they tend to practice on beautiful days like this. We got an egg! 
What? Yeehaw! Doing your egg dance. I like it. All right. That sun feels good. It does. <laughs> it's a gorgeous day of wonderful, nice, warm spring weather in the winter in the middle of January. Gotta love living in Georgia. This Georgia. Who wouldn't want to live here? Right? <laughs> I guess people that don't like the heat, they wouldn't want to live here. Yeah, that's true. It I does, like the heat. It does get pretty hot, but there's always air conditioning. Yeah. Okay? Okay, Paul and Katie? There's always <laughs> air conditioning. Anyway, this, this mama's going to go get off her feet. This has been a lot of activity for me today. Yeah. So, good exercise to keep me healthy, but got to know when to call it quits. So Ryan's going to finish up with the chores. Yeah. And get make sure everybody has their dinner. And That was a, a good opportunity to spend some time in the garden when otherwise, uh, usually gardens kind of get neglected and ignored this time of year so yeah it was, it was nice. nice i needed my soil therapy <laughs> it was good garden therapy is a good thing yeah thank you guys for watching you know the drill we'll see you next time on wholesome roots